So when Dr. Klepak told me that I was going to be doing a presentation, he asked me, what do you want to talk about for this? And I thought, well, why is arsenic a bad thing? You know, why is it a problem? Um, and so I did my research. And I found that arsenic is often consumed in small amounts, not usually all at once, which has long-term effects on your body. Um, so these effects are, you know, kidney cancer, uh, bladder cancer. And um, actually for women, when they have long-term effects from arsenic um, consumption, it affects the child too when they become pregnant and it causes um, developmental issues, birth defects, um, as you can see, reduced birth weight, increased infant mortality, and, and so on. And um, these are some pretty gruesome pictures, but this is essentially how bad it could get if you don't stop the problem um, from the beginning. Uh, this, uh, this data over here um, shows the red areas, you know, 80 to 100 percent of the wells contaminated with arsenic. This was a, uh, it was an outbreak that was pretty bad. It's not really, um, yeah, so it, it causes um, cancerous lesions um, and a lot of gross things that aren't good. <laughs> so. Also, it can um, influence the IQ level of young kids, so it'll actually chronically make it decrease um, between, you know, ages 4 and 10. So um, in Maine, that's actually a problem, too, because we have high levels of arsenic. So um, it causes low IQ. And the bladder cancer rates in this um, diagram, graph, I'm not a scientist, but uh, Um, Sixty-three million Americans um, from rural central California to the boroughs of New York City, you know, were exposed to potentially unsafe water um, during the past decade based on EPA data. And the EPA um, on the right side of the graph, it, in the red, it says about three to four percent. No, that's that's the uh, capacity of EPA, I think. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, that it and Maine's and Maine's in the red, so that that's not good essentially. So um, Maine, Maine mainly has um, very high level of arsenic in there, in the water, um, which is because we, we use private wells over public a lot, and um, it doesn't get tested. So uh, we don't you normally know that we have arsenic in our water until you know, we've consumed too much and it causes problems that we weren't aware of. And then for this, this was a study that showed um, that the, the difference between the average or the general public that um, knew that there was a problem and actually thought that it was a problem based on their education, which was interesting. So if you have a, the majority of people who had a bachelor's degree often said that arsenic was a problem and that they should treat it compared to the um, ones who weren't, had, didn't have the education. And the income on the right of the, the slide 
showed that usually the higher the income, the um, more tested and treated the wells were compared to lower income households and um, lower educated households. Um, so this, this is basically um, data from counties in Maine, um, from Kennebec and Hancock. Um, 23% uh, of the Kennebec County said that they didn't know if their arsenic levels were tested in their wells. 48% said no, and 23% said yes. So 48% of the county's water was not tested, which is a pretty big amount. Um, and then for the Hancock County, 45% uh, was tested for arsenic, which is good. That's good. And this is kind of the same thing. Um, there are high levels of arsenic across the state, not just on the coast, because there's bedrock everywhere. Um, and even though the mean of the two counties was vastly different, the median was still relatively similar. So the arsenic in the general um, state was the same, but still pretty high. This is where I start. So the question we asked was, if bedrock affects arsenic concentrations, does the depth of the well affect the amount of arsenic in the water? Um, the SEPA data set does not specifically um, correlate with well depth data, but it does report on well type, which reflects the depth directly. Um, drilled wells are between 100 and 1,000 feet deep. Um, where driven wells are only between 30 and 100, and dug wells between 10 and 30. We found that the most extreme values were in the drilled wells that were over 100 feet, because drilled wells typically go into bedrock, and then the driven wells had the least amount of arsenic, because they're typically between 30 and 100 feet, so they're right about in the center. They're not quite re reaching bedrock, bedrock, but they, unlike the dug wells, are not having as much influence of surface water. And then on the bottom here, it just shows that the groundwater is geologic sources and the surface water is anthropogenic. Our other question that we asked was, what are the various anthropogenic sources of arsenic and which are most likely to be affecting well water in Maine? These are all different types of anthropogenic sources, um, but more specifically, we have pesticide and road salting to be the most effective. So my name is Trinity Hutchins. I'm a senior at Snow or Maine Arts Academy, sorry. Um, and I'm going to start talking about gypsy moth. Um, seems kind of unrelated, but you'll see in a second. So Etienne Leopold Trevolo, um, he was interested in silk production and moved to Massachusetts in the 1850s. So he was interested in etymology. He got a bunch of gypsy moths and brought them and were cultivating them in his backyard. A couple of the larvae eventually escaped. Um, he told the local etymologist, but no further action was taken at that time. Um, after that, he kind of lost interest in etymology. And fun fact, he has a crater on the moon named after him now because he uh, became interested in astronomy. Um, so... And then the outbreak started, where we started seeing a lot of gypsy moths, um, and it became a huge problem. Um, so here we see there were a bunch of different ways that people tried to remove them. Uh, they tried taking them out of the trees by hand, which is not very practical. They tried um, setting the forests on fire that were infested, um, but the best way was to use pesticides, usually with arsenic in them. Um, so here we see is the use of lead arsenate, which was the most widely used um, arsenical pesticide. Um, 
and it was used mostly from the 1920s all the way through the 1950s when it was replaced by another pesticide, DDT. Um, I'm going to be focusing on apple orchards because their lead arsenate was sprayed in more frequent intervals um, and in much higher concentrations than on other crops. Um, so here we see that even they had to actually wash the apples in acid baths um, to get the residues from the pesticides off them. Uh, lead arsenate was not banned until the 1980s. Um, here we see a picture of Barber Orchard, which was is a subdivision in North Carolina where there was once a really big apple orchard and they had a very, they did not take care of their pesticides well. They had a piping system that was really leaky and there were a lot of what's called hot spots where the pesticide was dumped. Um, so there's a whole bunch of contamination. They were seeing um, cancer and birth defects. So it eventually became a super fun site to try and get the cleanup done. So here we see the question, if dug wells represent surface water, which can be affected by anthropogenic sources, uh, so pesticides, um, does the arsenic in dug wells correlate with lead that may come from historic pesticide use? Um, so we know that pesticide, arsenic travel, it's there, anyway, arsenic travels better than lead. We see it get to the streams um, and down the streams much farther than lead does. So it can, we see it almost 600 meters downstream while only, we only see lead 200 meters downstream. We also know that only six, that 65% of the initial concentration of arsenic gets to the stream while only 12% of the lead does. Here we see arsenic levels versus lead levels in the dug wells. And you'll notice that there's much higher arsenic than lead levels, but that's not surprising knowing what we do about how arsenic travels. Um, we see three points that do have lead and arsenic in them, um, and we're wondering if road salt might play a part in that, which I will explain in a moment. Um, in all our wells, we only saw two wells that had both lead and arsenic in them, but again, we didn't test specifically by apple orchards or where there would be lead arsenic contamination, so we don't, we don't really know for sure from our data set. We don't have enough data specifically testing for this. So what's the deal with road salt? Maine spreads over half a million tons of salt on its roads every year. In Waterville, 1,500 tons are spread on 280 lane miles. That's a whole lot. <laughs> so what road salt does is it, go, it, it mobilizes the heavy metals in the soil. So specifically lead and arsenic is what I'm talking about. Um, so it goes from the roads into, into the soil, and then that allows the heavy metals to go down into the groundwater and in, get into the surface water. So here we see some graphs of how um, as you get more of the road salt, um, you see more arsenic. So you see the correlation between those graphs. And we know that it is specifically road salt because of the molar ratio you see on the on the purple graph there, at the molar ratio that we see in road salt, there's a huge spike in arsenic. So we know it's caused by road salt. We see the same thing for lead here. So this is the same graphs we see, but for lead. So if there's lead there, if it's really close to the orchard or wherever the contaminated site, you would see a lot of lead too, if exposed to road salt. So we can't really tell um, if this is a huge problem from our data set because we weren't testing specifically for road salt. Um, we didn't even test for though, we didn't test for road salt at all in this. Um, but if we, we might be able to find correlations uh, with some road salt data from the state, but we don't have, we don't know specifically where all the wells we tested were, so we can't really tell. Um, anyway, it could still be a problem if you live by an orchard, uh, road salts everywhere, so it could still be a huge problem. And I believe I'm handing it back to Gally. All right, this is um, our bigger data set that we have. And out of, there were a total of 1,079 wells out of all of the states that were involved. And 396 of those tested with at least one 
um, of the categories out of range. Um, if you look at the bold arsenic, um, with all of the states, 21% of them tested out of range for arsenic. Um, when you go just to the next column, with only Maine, 19% um, tested out of range. And then specifically in Kennebec and Somerset counties, we have 18%. And our school only had one sample um, that was outside of range. Um, the EPA limit is 10. And we had one sample that was in the 15 range, but we only had 18 samples total, so it's hard to tell exactly how likely. Um, this is comparing arsenic versus uranium level by well type, and we noticed that only a few of the wells directly correlated the two. Um, as you can see in this little triangle, we had a little under 10 wells that were specifically correlated with arsenic and uranium. Um, one of our questions was, does domestic filtering help? Kind of was our answer. Um, out of all of the data, um, there were 20% that didn't know, 3% that wasn't available, 48% that had no filtration, and 29% that had some form of filtration. And as you can see in the no filtration, there are some really high levels of arsenic, as well as in the category of some filtration. So the real important section of this is the sink mounted filter, which is in bold. And this was really proved to be not super effective. Um, the median was by far the highest in this, um, still being above the EPA limit. It was 13.63, even with a sink mount. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's all that we have.